morning, everybody, and welcome to this year's FME Intelligence event. We have a, another jam-packed agenda for you this year. Um, I'm going to open with a really small welcome and a bit of an introduction to everybody. And then Don will take, uh, take over on his presentation on the future of FME. So again, I think it's nearly 1.30 in the morning a.m. for Don over in Vancouver, British Columbia. So again, we really appreciate him coming in. Here's his camera jumping on here now. So uh, Don, thanks a million for coming. Um, and then from there, we'll hand over to Gavin and Kieran, who are going to present on what's new in FME 2022. And then we'll also have then Philip from the Evaluations Office speaking about data-driven reporting automated by FME. We'll then take a short 15-minute break, so get a cup of tea, sandwich, a bit of breakfast, and then jump back to us. And we'll have Michael from Dublin Fire Brigade presenting on using webhooks in FME server for Tableau reporting. We then have Horve from IMGS presenting on CAD validation using FME and FME server apps. Uh, Kira Betty, who is a seasoned veteran at these events for us, and she'll be presenting on Prime 2 to products, automated map production with FME. Uh, then myself and Ardy from IMGS will be presenting on scaling for the enterprise. And then we'll have Robin from National Broadband Ireland presenting on their use of FME. Then we'll close by present or by, we'll close by having Kieran Kirk talking or showing data capture uh, and BI integration, and then finally Tanya and myself and Gavin will probably just do a quick wrap up and close. So from the IMGS side, I just wanted to meet the team. So Gavin, I'm sure everybody's very very familiar with. He's our lead solutions consultant. He's also our resident certified FME trainer, uh, FME professional, and FME server professional. Um, there's myself, Gary Cronin. I'm the commercial manager here at IMGS, and I'm also a certified business professional. It's great to finally have a little icon now. So Gavin doesn't have these three beside me all the time. Very proud of it. Um, we also have Horve, who is our lead, uh, one of our lead technicians. He's a certified desktop and He's just actually about to go for a server um, certification. And then we have Kieran Kirk, who probably needs no introduction after 20 years in industry. And um, so Kieran is our operations director. I also want to call out at the team in the background. So Aileen Stewart, who is our delivery director. Uh, I know most people will probably know her from working with her on different projects. And um, we have Tanya, who is the glue that keeps these events together. And Tanya, thank you um, for all of the effort of bringing this all together. Um, we have Zubair and Ryan also in the background who have been working to get some of these demos together. Um, so Zubair is our lead GIS developer. He's also certified server and desktop, similar to Gavin with 20 years experience. And then Ryan, who's our one of our IT solutions leads and again he'll be certified shortly so we've quite a broad um spectrum of registra registrations or people who have registered so over 150 this year which is which is amazing and um, so i need to cater for obviously the people that have are, are, are veterans in fme but also some of the, the newer users that are here today so i guess what we're hoping to be able to show through some of the presentations from our customers is to be able to face some of these organizational challenges things like cross-team data sharing which you'll probably see from from philip's presentation a bit of what kieran will show later on and um, a bit of manual uh, inefficiency to be able to tackle these again this will be be covered in some of the other presenters presentations and then things like with Horve that data variety volume and interoperability I know there's countless more examples of challenges that organizations face um, on a daily basis but these are just some that we're starting to look at um, FME has obviously been rooted in geospatial but as you'll see from today's presentation even last year we're starting not to move away from it because it will always be a core pillar but start to look at how else it can be deployed across the enterprise to be able to tackle some of the challenges that we we, we see today and these are some of the enterprise integrations we're starting to see so more gis and it working in unison to be able to take data from cloud data warehouses like azure google aws snowflake obviously taking data from other external sources like iot devices and um, enterprise systems which has obviously been bread and butter for fme for quite a long time but things like um, hexagon esri maximo etc and then on-premise data sources whether they're excel files file shares databases etc and now we're starting to see fme use more in that enterprise um scenario where it's data integration application integration data quality bit of stewardship workflow automate autom automation with that end goal to make data more accessible to business users to help them make more informed decisions and to hopefully uh, ultimately improve services whether that's to customers in a commercial sense or citizens or even just other departments inside the organization 
And again, FME allows us to do that by able to being able to connect to over, I think it's 450 out of the box um, systems. Uh, I think it's well uh, over, I think it's nearly a thousands now, Don. I think if you take in what's up there on the hub as well in these custom integrations, um, transform that data in over 500 different ways and then to automate it. And automation being the key, something we've been speaking about it for a while and you can talk about enterprise integration and not automation. You resources are limited. Um, obviously, to try have boots on the ground is is, is extremely expensive and, and hard to come by good talent. So having FME in the background to automate and power that flow of data around the organization is paramount in today's enterprise. Again, I show this slide every year and I do it. It's probably my favorite slide. I, I say it every year, but again, it's just that breadth of, so when I say connect, uh, it is it's huge. And if you're new to FME, you may have only kind of come in at maybe the CAD or GIS or BIM, or even from a data perspective, but again, to look at how much you can expand that across your organization is, is incredible. Right through to some of the newer stuff we're seeing today, like IoT devices, uh, BI integration, which um, both Michael and Kieran will, will talk about, um, AOR and VOR, so again, that augmented reality piece. And then again, being able to take some of that, whether it's just scripting with likes of Python and OR, but if there is things like TensorFlow from, from Google, again, from an AI and ML standpoint. So it's really, really vast in terms of what we can tackle. And then this is the FME integration platform as a whole. So again, desktop is where you will build those particular workflows to run. Server is where you will take those workflows and make them available to the enterprise to be able to self-serve, to run processes themselves, or to have these engines in the background pushing and pulling information in and out of your organization. FME Cloud is the exact same as FME Server, it's just hosted. And we're very, very lucky in Ireland that we have an AWS instance here. So again, when we're, we're talking about data residency, or if there is a concern about data residency or GDPR, again, you know that data can be kept here in Ireland. And then FME Mobile is probably more of one of the newer applications um, from Safe Software, really starting to grow over the last two years. And it's where well, we've seen great success with it within Ireland and the likes of Dublin City Council um, is for when you want to either A, do really, really quick data capture. So again, one or two attributes out in the field, um, map where a, a, a parking a meter is, a lamppost, instead of having to roll out a full-on mobile GIS, it's quite useful, but also at scale. So um, we all use our own uh, enterprise GIS platforms, but when you start rolling that out to an entire depot, for example, of 500, 1,000 users it can get quite costly. Uh, FME Mobile is great for giving those, being able to push information out to these, these people in the field. So again, uh, watch that space over the, over the next little while. Um, I wanted to touch on Gartner briefly, and again, I don't want to steal any thunder from Don's, but I would mentioned it last year as well. And again, when we talk about the enterprise, it's hard not to come across the name Gartner. And again, Don and Dale and the team in Safe Software have been working with them to get a, a broader view of, of the industry from an enterprise standpoint. Yes, GIS will always be a core pillar when inside the FME platform, but now it's looking at new and innovative ways that we can change FME to suit the enterprise, whether that's from a data quality perspective, data stewardship, um, dynamic engines, et cetera. And you can see that over the last little while as the product is really starting to evolve over the last few years to make it even easier for business users to get to the access to the information that they need in a format that they want to be consumed on a device that they want or a citizen, for example. So again, some really, really great work and, and the team are continuing to move up um, in that particular area. Um, I'm nearly finished. So um, I suppose from a social standpoint, please follow us along. So if you have your mobile phone there, you can pop it out in front of your screen. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Again, we'll be pushing up a lot of the content from today up there. Again, you can use the hashtags on the right-hand side. YouTube in particular is where we push a lot of content. Um, so again, all the presentations from today will be pushed up onto YouTube, so you'll be getting them afterwards as well. Um, it wouldn't be an event if we didn't have some form of gamification and prizes. So uh, the platform is gamified. So if you visit the IMGS Expo, you get five points. We also have a safe software expo as well. So again, these are just kind of little uh, areas that you can go into. You can also chat in the boot. Keen from IMGS will be in both. He's our, uh, one of our newest members and support desk manager. So again, pop in, ask some questions and you'll get some points. I know last year there was a lot of hellos um, inside the comment boxes. And you can also download content from the expo 
repos do drop into safe softwares where we have the new transformer guide i know that is a, a love of everybody's uh, digitally i think is a lot easier and then we'll have prizes for a first second and third um last year we did have a lot of people that would all equal points so if that happens again this year we'll put some names into a hat and then um, we'll we'll send out some prizes from there because i do know you all love your fme swag your safe software swag so I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to hand over to the dynamic Don, not to put you under any pressure, who's going to talk about the, the future of FME. So again, Don, I just want to thank you again for coming and joining us at such a late hour. Yeah, yeah, my, my pleasure. So uh, thanks for having me. So let's see if I can make this work. So with any luck, you should see my slide. Look at that. So um, yeah, so, so thanks so much. Um, you know, I'm really I'm excited to be here working with IMGS for the last 20 years has been nothing but a pleasure. And um, I'm going to talk about something near and dear to my heart because this is where I spend most of my time um, thinking about and um, and setting the vision for safe. And so here we go. Nope, wrong screen. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So first of all, I have to say not everything on, you know, on here is going to happen, although I try to really make sure that what I talk about is going to happen. But anyway, I would have a visit with our legal department if I didn't say this. So there you go. I've said it. Yeah. And so, yeah. So the first thing is, um, and Garrett touched on this, is um, the FME Enterprise Integration Platform. And the key thing is that we're the only spatially aware, you know, integration platform. I was at a show last week and I talked with a company called Rivery and I asked them about their Snowflake support and then I asked them about, oh, their data type support and what do you know, they don't support the geometry and geography um, um, data types. And, um, and, and while, you know, you might think, well, he's just being, he's just being cheeky. Um, actually, um, spatial data is now more important than, you know, than, than anywhere. Not a, a week goes by and I'm not talking with yet another new company that wants to add spatial, some spatial capabilities to their, their, their database. And so Snowflake has been the, um, the, you know, one of the ones that gets a lot of press. They're a huge company growing. Um, but you can see more and more are on there. You can see Databricks in the bottom um, left as well as another one that's going to be adding it. And so you know, a really exciting time. And they're adding this capability, not because they they want to, but because they, well, maybe they want to. I mean, why wouldn't they? But um, because there's a demand in the industry for them to, to add that. So that's um, really exciting because at SAFE, that's where we, um, that, you know, that's one of our key differentiators when we go against anybody is um, our breadth of spatial support. So, so, yeah, so we build the tools. That's what SAFE does. Um, and we get the opportunity to work with great partners like um, IMGS, who, um, and then they help you. And the whole thing is you're going to hear this term. Our, our goal at SAFE is, and with our partners is to help you bring data to life. Um, if data is just sitting in a data store somewhere not being used, if it's not you know, taking part in, in being used by your organization, then you're not getting any value from it. So it's only when this data comes to life that you actually get value from your data able to make new decisions. And so that's really exciting because after all, you know, <clears throat> all the practitioners in the room, you are the data artisans. You are the ones who, when we meet are, we're just blown away by the amazing thing that you do with our tool. And so, and um, you know, we refer to you guys as the champions of data integration because all of the solution stories that we, we get excited about are done, are done by you. So it's really a partnership. And um, so please do keep asking, um, working with IMGS and others and telling us what you need to, um, to do more. So, yeah, so with that, um, some of the other things that we're, we, we strive to be better than code. Um, and I was at an airport show and I commented that, you know, we looked at all the different things that they're using FME for. And I commented that the price of this is of a subscription for this airport is less than the cost of one, you know, Python developer per year. And so... And, um, and so it has to be better than code. It also has to be better than coding. Um, we really, really strive to make a no code environment that is, you know, super productive. And, and also you can engage the domain experts through the visual, the visual interface to really help you build things um, quicker, better, and more reliable than ever. And so what are some of the things that we're, we're working towards at SAFE? 
Um, the first thing is we want to make the FME platform really strong for enterprise deployment. And what do we mean by that? We're working on making the FME um, support C your CID, C um, CICD pipeline, um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, so that if you're an organization that has development, testing, staging, and production workflows that with our FME tools, it's easier than ever to, uh, to work through those. And there's a number of things we're doing. We've, we're adding an FME server command line. And with this command line, the CLI tool, you'll be able to um, install, license, backup, restore, all those operations um, through scripts. So you'll be able to put it in things like Jenkins. You'll be able to work with other enterprise tools. Um, and, you know, and why does this matter? We want to um, enable people to use, you know, infrastructure as code, automate all the FME server administration th um, things they want to do. And, um, and so this is, you know, just at the beginning of how you need to be able to deploy a new, a new FME. Um, so some of the things we're working on, you'll see um, there's an FME server configuration store. And this is a standardized set of um, values that are different across those. So in dev and test, you might have a, a different database than you would in production. Um, you never want your developers to be touching your um, development database. I mean, your production database. Believe me, I can tell stories, but um, for another day. And, um, and, um, and so, but you don't want to have to touch your workflows as you move them along. You want to just move your workflows untouched and then they just pick up, you know, the new, the new, um, the new values. Um, FME server projects, we're improving those so that they're much more easier to build. And um, the FME server helps you identify the things that need to go in so you can move them with complete confidence. And last but not least is this whole idea of a, a publish API to publish your workflows to FME in an automated fashion without having to use Workbench. And so the configuration store, um, this is just a quick example of it. Um, adding a configuration store value here, um, an S3 bucket that's gonna be used in an automation. And, um, and very quickly, you're going to see that then he's going to go to automations here. He's going to open one and, um, and he's going to be able to see those configuration store values um, within his automation so that then if he moves the automation, um, these parameters are separated from the automation. They're not part of the automation. And this is really going to make it easy for organizations to, you know, to have these different values and different servers to, uh, to move the data across. And so don't worry, the final GUI will not be like this one. Um, this was, um, I leaned on my developers and said, just hack anything together. I need, I need it for a, a quick demo. So, yeah. So anyway, that, that gives you the idea there. So that's really exciting. Okay. So, so that's the first thing. So the second thing is we'll deliver data to mobile platforms. And so FME Mobile. So the first thing I want to say about FME AR is it goes hand in hand with our digital twin initiative. There's no better way to experience your digital twin um, than using augmented reality. Um, when you think about what is augmented reality, by definition, it's spatial. You, we're painting data onto you and using the real world as a canvas. And so you can just see some of the, the images above of the, um, you know, the, the infrastructure under the ground. I'm going to call those my digital twins of my street data, right? Um, I was at a conference and I made the point, we've always been building digital twins when we've been building these, you know, infrastructure in the ground and then mapping it. We just never called it digital twin. And then somebody invents a new term to help bring things together. And then we're like, oh my goodness, I need to build a digital twin. Well, if you have your infrastructure in the ground, by definition, you have a, a digital twin of your infrastructure in the ground. And and now you can just build it and make it more and more, you know, richer. So, um, so augmented reality is super exciting. Um, Data Express, again, here we're helping you to, to understand and be able to access your FME workflows um, directly from your mobile device. And, and um, you know, and that'll, that work will um, continue. Back to the whole... Um, you know, AR side of things. We've signed our first AR partnership with a company called Hollow One. And what does Hollow One build? They build a AR collaborative platform. So they have their own server. And so we're working with them to turn FME into the conduit to get to basically publish data from FME server to their platform, which then is a collaborative AR platform across many different devices where users using one device can 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 edit the the you know the AR experience 
and then everybody else sees it or they can work together. That's something we're not going to do, you know, on, you know, at safe, just like we're not going to build a GIS, you know, we are the data pipe. And so we are going to be able to update this um, platform of theirs in real time as the data changes so that all wherever these people are with this hollow one um, experience, um, the latest and greatest data. So that's really what we are. Same story. We're the pipe uh, for, for all types of data. So look forward to us um, signing partnerships with other um, AR um, platforms out there. There's many of them. And they all have the same thing. They need to get this spatial data into their system so they can paint reality. And um, and nobody can do it like us. Um, I was amazed, Dan, at the user conference of how light the technology has become. When you think of the, the first iterations of these glasses were really heavy, clunky, yeah. almost helmets. Yeah. To Now it feels like a pair of Ray-Bans with a, a small battery pack and a CPU kind of yeah. clipped through it. I, I thought it was incredible. And I have to say, I think they've done some amazing stuff. Yeah, it really is. And 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 the, the, the vendors are learning, you know, what they need to do. Like one of the um, surprising things to them is um, utility companies want to start using augmented reality. But, you know, the latest device for Magic Leap doesn't have a GPS in the device. And so and yeah. so, you know, and it's because they were thinking indoor, they were thinking other things. And so now you can bet the next version, you know, of these will have GPSs in the devices. And there's challenges with GPSs in these small devices, but but that's not an FME challenge. That's And they'll figure it out. I mean, mm -hmm. Apple and Google, they have a few smart people who are working on this problem. And uh, yeah. so we're going to focus on how do we, you know, embrace these to get the data to these devices. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's really, really um, exciting. So, yeah, yeah. So the third thing that we always work on at SAFE is how do we build FME to delight users? And what do we mean by that? We want to build the best code, um, no code experience at anywhere. And um, we think we have that, but we were always pushing it even further. So there's a number of things um, that we we're doing here. First thing, data inspector. When, whenever you're building a new workflow, you're, the data inspector is a key part of that. And so, again, just making it faster so that um, users aren't, you know, ever watching it draw. It just always seems to be there and being painted in real time. So that's the first, um, the first thing. Yeah. And, um, um, yeah, smarter authoring. How can we use the fact that we're processing data um, to our advantage as we're, we're, you know, we're working here. So here's the attribute manager. One of the biggest things that people use is the attribute manager. And so we're again, taking that to the next level, using the data that we're, that's part of our authoring experience to be smarter um, with it. Um, uh, making it easier for people to collaborate. So we have this workbench, workspace compare and merge, which we released in in 2022.0 and again we're continuing to work on that to make it better um, and easier and, and more useful so you know whenever you find a workspace or you have a workspace that's different from a previous one and you want to know what actually changed on this because it used to work you know and it doesn't work anymore or you know or it's different what's different about it and so that's um, really a key you know a key thing in any environment is this ability to look at different versions and see um, what's changed so we're excited about that um, and then you can see you know now we're looking at how do we change the views how can we filter how can we integrate it with git you know in order to engage um, you know the version control systems then you might want to see what's different from one version and get to the next version and get and and things like that so how can we continue um, to to, uh, to take this to the uh, to the next level yeah. and there you go git integration on the side um, in in Workbench. And of course, when you use Git in Workbench, we want to make sure that server also embraces it exactly the same way. So if you want, if you publish something on desktop um, to Git, you should be able to pull that in on server um, directly. So there's the great work being done, being done there. Yeah. Um, inline spatial SQL. This, the um, inline querier is probably one of the most underappreciated transformers in FME. And, um, and it really enables you to, you know, right within your workspace, build these tables and then use full-blown SQL to, um, to, to pull data out. So this is just one example of, of what, it, what, you know, what it looks like. You see these roads, rivers, and parks going in. And then you can see how each output port now you can have full-blown, um, you know, SQL 
to be able to pull those pull those apart um, and really really gives you a lot of flexibility and power. Um, you know, my I'm a I'm a SQL. I wouldn't even call myself a SQL novice. My daughter was in university doing a database course and she showed me her SQL that went on for pages. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And uh, my mind is like select star from, you know, and, um, you know, but anyway, SQL super powerful. And there's lots of people out there who are really great with SQL and um, the ability you'll notice in there, you know, there's full um, um, geometric operations like ST intersects and ST length and things like that right within your workspace. So, and, and that's another thing that we, we strive at FME to do, safe to do, is to make sure we embrace all the underlying technology that we can. If we have a database, we want to push it to the database. So, yeah. So, yeah. So next coming out is a powerful no-code GUI designer. And, and the goal here is to enable our users to build rich GUIs like we have in the rest of FME. And we're going to use this internally as well as we build new code. And um, the idea is to give... Um, as much power to creating your GUIs for your custom transformers and custom formats and, you know, um, workspace dialogues as, as you have with um, throughout FME. And so, and this will be on desktop and um, at server at the same time. So really, really, you know, a big, a big deal. And you'll see there's conditionally, vi um, conditionally visible parameters. So depending on the value of one parameter um, that they'll change for another parameter. So here's, you know, when the, when the operation mode is production, um, it has two values. And then when it's, um, and here we go, when you, when you pick production, you can pick a database connection. And when you pick test, you pick um, something else just to show how you can um, use these to, to basically really, really customize what your GUIs are going to do based on, on how they, um, on, on the previous setting. So um, enterprise agility, this is the ability for FME server to not only show you what's going on. So this actually is in 2022.2. Um, and now when you're looking at server load insights, you can see not just the engines, but you can also see, um, and this one's the engine. So we shipped that one. So you can see the engine, you know, what engine's not being used. But now you can also see individual queues. Um, to see which queues and how busy they are, as well as individual, um, yeah, individual engines was this one. So you could see the individual engines. So again, understanding where your load is on server is really, really key. And, you know, do we have any engine resources that aren't being used? And as you add more and more engines, this becomes more and more um, important. You might also want to see, you know, how much are my CPU based or dynamic engines being used? So you can really get good insights into server. Um, you know, that's huge, Dan. If you don't want me just jumping in there quick, and no. it's something that our own customers we had we've actually built our own workspaces for customers that they would run to get those type of outputs, and now to have it inside it baked in is is amazing, especially for our enterprise customers that would have yeah. five, six, ten engines to be able to start seeing exactly when is the best time to do it, where is my traffic, where I have a really big workflow, when is the best time to run it. I, it's it's incredible. So well done to the team. Yeah, no, and please do. I mean, these ideas come from a lot of them come from users and. Um, <laughs> Yes. And, and the next one is, you know, users, again, they said, you know, we have these jobs that are submitted throughout the day, but these particular jobs, we, we don't want to run them during the day. We want to leave our, our we want to leave our server for to support our users who are online. And so and so then we end, we create this thing called engine rule active periods. And so it's basically jobs are assigned to a queue. Maybe your queue is called weekends. And then, you know, the jobs are assigned throughout when they come to this queue called weekends. And engines or resources aren't actually given to this queue until the weekends. And so that enables you to not have to do really weird things to try to make that happen through REST APIs, but actually have the server, the server do that. So you're able to give your work, your engines to the most important, um, the most important work when needed, because when you start building these automations and these FME server apps, you want to make sure that they get the resources um, as soon as the requests come in. Yeah. And okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah. So the other one is, you know, unrivaled performance. I was just at a big data show and really a big data show is just a data show. Um, data is just getting bigger by the, by, and, you know, and so, but the point of this one is how can we make FME faster so it can process bigger data faster. And um, it's all about performance and, um, you know, we've been working on this for a number of years, and this is coming to completion where we will have finished 
this um, we, it's called bulk mode, but that doesn't really matter. What it really is all about is put, rolling out this new way of processing data across the entire FME platform. And with, you know, the beta and FME 2023, now we're at 90%. And um, we think we're going to be at a hundred percent, you know, in um, sometime in the year 2023, but um, we, we all remember the early days when we did this, you would have something fast and you have one transformer in the way that just blew things apart and then it would slow down. Now we're really starting to see, you know, the the speed improvement of uh, FME. So it's um, really, really exciting. And um, what um, type of volumes are you putting through that when you're testing, I guess? that, that, that... <clears throat> Oh, billions, you know, like billion, we're seeing billions of rows now. So, wow. yeah, and there's, um, we, we had one client um, also who's moving data from Denodo to Snowflake and they were moving billions and billions of records. So that's kind of the order. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and our goal at FME is to make you the, the, the communication pipeline, the bottleneck, right? Cause then it's not our problem. Okay. Yeah. We've saturated your database or we've saturated your communication channel. So that's where we never want people to say, oh, FME is the bottleneck. So that's our goal. So, and, um, and so obviously with server, you can also parallelize things, but uh, yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. It's incredible. And data types, right? Garrett showed this one. He's missing the real time one, so he has an out of date slide. But uh, I'll talk to him about that later. And this is, um, again, this, <laughs> this is really our strength, right? And when you look at FME compared to other tools, there's nobody who comes close to attaching, attacking all these different types of data. And real time, we're really starting to see um, a take up um, this being taken up. Um, and um, in Canada, there's two railways and they both are using FME for real time um, data. We have fleets out there um, and it's really, really exciting to, to, to again. And the thing that's really exciting about us is m many organizations, they have a real time tool and then they have the traditional data tool and they're different tools. Then they have to figure out how to get those to work together with FME, all your FME skills, you can apply directly to uh, real time. Um, yeah, some other things, Revit writing's coming. So I know... Um, you know, in the digital twin world and others um, that people are excited about that. IFC5 and Rhinoceros, other systems. Um, City GML3, I met with the team this week and they're, they're, they're um, you know, doing that. Um, um, cloud native storage, a lot of different things we're adding to um, cloud native storage. So you can see some there, Airtable, Trimble Connect, um, Stack, Delta Lake. This is a big one. Um, you know, if you work with Databricks or others, Delta Lake is an exciting data lake technology that we're, we're working on. And um, there's just many, many more that um, are coming. So, yeah. And um, yeah, cloud, cloud um, optimized shape files. And, you know, shape file continues to, to live on. So, yeah. Digital twins, um, lots of exciting here. We do a lot of work on this. Of course, digital twins require you to bring lots of different types of data together and then combine it. And, um, and by definition, it's spatial. So you're, we're doing a lot of work there. If you go, if there's in Japan, they've done, you know, 80 of the largest cities um, using FME. So digital cities is a digital twin of a city. And, um, and there you go. So, yeah. So some of the work there, we're, we're working on Autodesk Tandem, um, iTwin from Bentley. And um, um, so that's that. The other, the other place that we're really excited is, and this is a big one is the futures web applications. And our goal is to make the FME platform the best and easiest way for you to connect to any web service. And, um, and so um, that's the goal. And so you probably all heard of this open API initiative. This is an open API um, specification where any REST-based API can be described and, and, um, and presented so software can consume it like FME and then generate the interfaces for you. Anybody who's um, using FME now is using the HTTP caller. And of course, the way I use that is I usually start with something like Postman and build all my, make sure my, my um, calls work. And then I take them from Postman and I move them into the HTTP caller. This is going to drastically reduce the effort that is required there. So there's a site, there's many of these sites. So for example, a site called apis.guru is a site where you can see many of these open APIs that have been published by companies. Our FME server is, um, follows the open API spec, so does FME Cloud, and um, yeah. So And so the, it's really gonna be simple. You're gonna basically go to that site and um, point to an API, 
and it's going to generate you um, these all these commands will be hidden behind GUI. So don't worry, you won't have to remember them. But at the end of the day, what it's going to do is it's going to um, <clears throat> generate you. You're going to pick the endpoints you want to generate. And then it's going to build you. Um, it's safe. We have these things called packages, which are on the hub. And these are whole collections of Python code with GUIs that will enable you to work directly with, um, with FME. So if you go to the FME hub and you type like... Um, um, Confluence, for example, you'll see there's some connectors there and you're going to see that this thing will just do it, make it really easy, look after all the details. So then here you go, you do install it on Workbench and you would see, you know, you would see the calls. And this is really working already in Workbench. Um, and so it's just going to make it so much easier for you to just, oh, I need to talk to that system. Oh, it has an open API. I'm going to point to it. I don't even have to know you know, what the calls are or, or, you know, how to set up the headers and things like that. It's just going to do it for you. So this is something that we're really, really excited about. And, um, and you're going to see coming very, very shortly. Okay. So the next one is deploy FME where you want, how you want, when you want. Um, where do you want to deploy FME? Close to the data. That's always the answer. People say, I want server. I want cloud. I, my first question is, where's your data? Oh, it's on premise. Okay. Yeah. If you want performance, FME loves to be close to the data. You got to get that engine close to the data. And so, so we're working on how can we do that? Well, one way is um, let's embrace these new chips. Um, Graviton three from Amazon and Apple now has the M2. They're all arm chips, super fast. I'm running one this morning and, um, and they're really a lot of, um, you know, really impressive technology. So <clears throat> But server, currently, you know, you have marketplaces, we have manual deployments. Um, coming in the fall of 2022, you're going to see we have Terraform Azure. We have Bicep templates for Windows. We have Kubernetes, um, distributed containerized deployments, cloud formation templates, Terraform. And again, making it really easy so that you can deploy FME anywhere. And, um, and so, yeah, you're going to be hearing about those very, very, um, very shortly. Um, but many organizations now, they, they're embracing more than one cloud, right? Like I want some on AWS, I want some on Azure, I want some on Google, and I want some on premise. Where should I install my server? And, um, and so we're working on, and this is, this is going to happen in FME 2020. I better get my years straight because after 20 years, they all start to run together. Um, FME 2023. So, um, so here, you know, there's a server I have running where the the, um, the master is running, I'll call it that, in AWS West region. Then we have these job services, one running on AWS UK, another one running on Azure, another one running on Google Cloud, another one running on AWS East. But they're all acting as one server. And then using those crazy engine rules that, that we came up with, you're able to assign jobs to run um, on the different these different regions um, again be close to data and there's other reasons to be close to data and you know if you pull data out of a cloud you end up having to pay for that if you can push FME into their cloud and run it locally then often the cost that you're in incurring with the FME there is less than the cost of the egress that's what we're you know by some of the customers who are playing with the really really early versions of this so yeah and so yeah three con move on don i suppose then um, it's difficult when it's when it's virtual but this nearly got a standing ovation i think at the uc over in uh, yes. Vancouver there a couple of weeks ago it was just such a huge huge thing to have that and exactly for all the reasons that you're saying that obviously fme loves to be close to the data and again that yeah. that real kind of dynamic approach to to, to uh, i suppose um, your, your data flows so uh, yeah it was incredible and i suppose it's just difficult when it's virtual but i know it, it's a huge one hopefully um for our customers here today as well yeah, no, yeah, well, we're pretty excited. But I, I, if I had to pick two things, I think the web thing, you know, being able to easily consume any, any REST service is really, really yeah. super exciting. And then I think this, this hybrid ability to approach, um, to deploy FME is super, super exciting. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, no, so, um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, so it's a uh, busy challenging. Turn COVID, I assume the whole engineering team. Yeah, I got my yeah. best people on it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And this is going to be, I'll, yeah, this is going to, this is going to take us a while to to finish for sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, and here's a simple. This one is me. I'm just showing off my prowess with uh, Google, Google Slides. But this gives you the idea. 
you know, a job is submitted and um, it goes to the master FME server and then it's sent to an FME Cloud UK. I made that name up, um, Q. And, um, and then you'll notice the Q type is remote. So then the system automatically marshals that workspace and associated data and packages and custom form transformers, all the associated stuff and the connections has to be moved over. Um, and um, we're smart so that if the workspace is already there, that we can save some time, but we always assume it's not. And then, so then we have to job marshal all of that across so that it's executed, you know, in this case, in the cloud system on, you know, in the UK or Ireland or wherever that has to be. And um, yeah, so really, really um, um, super. So when is this going to be available? Um, it's going to be available in FME 2023.0. Um, initially, it'll be for job submitter and schedules that run jobs. And um, and then we're, we're working on adding automations. Automations is tough because we have to build a fully distributed automation framework. Because you can imagine you have, you send a job to a workspace in on the Ireland AWS. It's using the automation writer, writes a whole bunch of things. Some of those ports that then run you know, on a Google cloud somewhere else. And so, um, and so what we're going to be doing there, I've never seen anybody else do it, honestly, having a fully distributed um, single task, like a single automation, but it's actually run um, across different, different clouds. So this is um, really exciting. And this gives the technical, um, my best technical people, something to think about too, which is always, always good. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's many use cases, right? Like extend FME cloud deployments anywhere. So you might have your FME cloud, you know, in US East, and then you you have some, you have you want to also run some jobs in you know the Ireland um, AWS, or you know you want to use FME cloud to extend a deployment from on prem because you have some jobs that are running that are only talking to web services, and so if they're consuming web services, then you don't really need to run them on prem by definition. The data and it, and everything is already in the cloud, so you could push those there. So, or extend also any the, deployment anywhere. Yeah. Even from a data residency standpoint, if you've data that, yeah, exactly, that, that, that can't be processed outside of a particular source country, yes. again, process the data there and then just have the attribution or whatever, the outputs pushed back then to, to, to another yeah. country in order to work through the process. So, now again, another great example of it. Yeah. And, and, and that's a great point, Garrett. Oops. Um, because some companies, too, they have data on prem and they don't want that data. It's so strategic. They don't want that data to be leave the building, so to speak, 100%. right? So, you could push yeah. your FME. You could have an FME job service there, even though your, your um, FME server is officially like the, ma the, the main one is someplace else, but then you can really assure that your IT department or whoever it needs to be or your security people that no, 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 this data is not leaving our facility, right? So I'd say that'd be one of the most common use cases here in Ireland yeah, first, I'd yeah, say for, for, for that particular process. Yeah. So in yeah, bandwidth that, too, you might have, um, you know, you, you, by pushing the, uh, you have to be close to the data, your bandwidth goes up and your latency goes down. And sometimes talking to, we've all tried to talk to databases across the internet from time to time. And it, it's not the greatest experience for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, so, and the, the part of this will be the ability to run FME tasks from any application and, and really it is. So this is this new job service and this is kind of spins out of the FME server work. And the, and the, really the thing is like, why can't I run my FME job from, you know, um, Lambda, AWS Lambda or something like that? Why do I have to have, you know, FME server? And I think obviously FME server brings a lot of value to it. But at the end of the day, if, if I need to run my, you know, my FME like really close to my snowflake and I can get that engine in the same, you know, region on AWS as where that snowflake data is, then I can, I can get the data, I can get even better performance. And, and so, so there's a REST API that the FME um, server is using to build this distributed um, thing. So we're going to make that public. So then anybody will be able to do that and, and so that's really the the idea. It's licensed exactly the same as an FME server. Um, obviously, we 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 ripped out a bunch of the FME server technology, so it can be CPU based engines, or it could be, you know, dedicated engines, the more traditional type. So that's really um, where we're going. And so here are just some of the possibilities that you know, talking with folks, and you know, or some you know, anywhere you want. That's kind of the idea. You'll have this FME server job service so yeah 
yeah so yeah so um yeah so there you go i think i'm doing pretty good for time i was given 30 minutes and how am i here let me have a look i just, uh, look you at, just oh i'm spin. over 34 just, oh, okay. just, no you're okay you're okay keep working yeah yeah so yeah so you know brian adams like he went to the same high school as me and uh you know ain't it funny how time flies when the best is yet to come so uh yeah so and yeah so please do you know, one of the things I like getting out of the virtual space to the real world is being able to interact with people in a much more natural way. And, but please do tell us what you need through IMGS or direct, however you want, um, so that we build the right thing. We have lots of smart people at SAFE and we can build amazing stuff that is completely useless. Believe me, it'll be technically interesting, but it won't actually solve a real problem. So we like to do both you know, build things that, that are technically challenging, but also really useful because you guys there really are, you know, the champions of data integration. And we believe this at SAFE. This is one of our things, you know, we build the tools so you can make the decisions that are needed to improve lives, whether that be lives of your city, lives of your customers, or, um, you know, life and health on our planet. We have lots of challenges that we have to deal with as a, as a planet. And, um, and data is really critical in uh, helping us navigate through this and and all of you out there who are working with fme and other tools to use data to make better decisions we really you know and we, we want to empower you as much as we possibly can so yeah so and one more thing garrett any idea what this one more thing is oh i think i have an idea but go okay yeah yeah so uh so next year we're have we just finished our fme uc in vancouver um in 2022 Next year, we're having the FME UC Europe. Um, it'll be called the Peak of Data Integration again. It's in the world. It's in Bonn, Germany, um, September fourth to sixth um, at the World Conference Center. So we're we're doing that, co-hosting that with Conterra. So we're uh, really exciting. Um, we think we're going to have over a thousand people because um, we have so many users in Europe and and flying um, across Europe is much cheaper than flying to Vancouver. People tell me. And so we're really, uh, we're really looking forward to it. I think it would be huge. We had our 20th birthday quite recently and some of our customers had come along to it and they're already positioning themselves already for uh, building a use case for next year for it. So absolutely, I think it would be incredible to have a, a European event, which would be huge because obviously, yes, yeah. absolutely. Traveling all the way to, to Vancouver can be a little bit, um, um, yeah, expensive. But yes. no, uh, brilliant, Don. We actually have one question this year, which is surprising, and it is, will there be any developments on reading and writing SharePoint files? Only have the ability to read and write from SharePoint lists and download or upload files through SharePoint Online Connector? Yeah, so so SharePoint is something that comes up a lot. And so um, I would, if, if, if they could, if you could work with them, Garrett, to get the specifically what they want, then that would be, that would be great. SharePoint's a very large system. And so and so if you can get us um, exactly what they want, that would be, that would be really, really great. I get, yeah. So is this SharePoint online or SharePoint on-prem? Yeah, SharePoint or? online. Online, perfect. Six perfect. Yeah, that fits really well with our whole, you know, um, online strategy of this cloud native um, stuff. So that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So Pretty good. Done. Um, so anybody else, I guess, just to touch on, on Don's point there is just that if there is any questions, again, um, please leave each out to ourselves or Safe Software directly, obviously on the computer, or sorry, on the, the community hub. Again, you can vote for changes to the platform. And again, other users from around the globe can come in and upvote it. And again, the guys actively listen to it. And I think that's probably one of the greatest strengths of Safe Software is that they do actively listen to the user base and actually just constantly see things that people have suggested, even from people here in Ireland have suggested things over the years that, that have gone in, which, which is amazing. Uh, Don, I'm conscious of time, but I just want to thank you so much. I know it's probably maybe 2 30 over there. So really, really thank you for, for taking the time to join us again this year. Yeah, thank no, you. my pleasure. And thanks for inviting me. Like when yeah. Artie came and asked me if I wanted to do it, I'm like, absolutely. I yeah. you know, this is what I this is what I do and this is what I love doing. And so uh th thanks, you know, to you know, to you and to to Kieran and the IMGS team. It's you know, you're always one of our favorite partners to work with, um, you know, whether it be the accelerator or anything. One of the first things, oh, let's talk with IMGS. You know, they're uh, they're really forward looking and um, and just a joy to work with. So thank you so much. Thanks, Don. Thanks, thank Tom. you so much. Um, I am going to hand over to Kieran and Gavin now who are going to talk on what's new in FME 2022. Thank you. I say I'm um, really need to look at the agendas so I don't have to follow Don. So I've got all that fantastic 
stuff that it's just like yeah, yeah no I'm one ever wants to follow that. Don he's too yeah no one ever wants to follow Don but we have to inform. we'll put him at the end next time just before the wrap up I think yeah <laughs> try and get the right screen this time Cool. Now, hopefully, you can see the slides. <coughs> so, what we wanted to talk about today was obviously what's new in FME 2022. Um, I'm already excited about what's in 2023, so I'm much more interested in the stuff we've just seen because I think there's really, really good stuff there. There's some really exciting stuff, and I think it's really going to let us build out some really new, cool ideas. But like everything, it sits on that foundation. So there's an awful lot of stuff that sits in 2022 that's coming new, but obviously some of that builds out as well on what's already there. So whilst we're going to talk about what's in 2022, some of this is picking up some things that have already been there that you might have missed or that have become, I think, a little bit more relevant to our customers today. So not everything is brand new. Some of it's maybe little bits you've missed, overlooked and things, but I think are actually now really, really useful. Um, I can drive the slides. So obviously, Garrett's already mentioned, um, Gavin. Um, Kieran's going to help out with this one as well. So he's going to be taking some other slides um, as we go through. And traditionally, what we would have done is split this very much to talk about, you know, this is what's coming new in desktop. This is what's going to be coming new through in server. But these days, it's really about a platform. Um, it's very much more now that you can use the FME technology. It doesn't matter whether you're using the server technology, whether you're using the mobile components, that whether you're using desktop, you know, it's all really just this FME platform. And, you know, you just pick and choose the bits that you need. So if you're authoring something, that's probably going to be more desktop. But obviously, once you deploy, that's going to be looking more at the server platform. But it's that kind of integration between all of the technology now, and especially right through into things like the AR, the mobile devices as well. Um, that we can use as part of this. So where we're talking maybe something that sits in desktop, actually a lot of that's really just the FME engine under the hood. So those kind of things are going to carry over into um, server as well. So especially when we touch on some of the performance, um, it applies to both. So when we went to the UC earlier this year, there was a fantastic presentation from Pixar, all about obviously how they develop the stories, how you need like a little hero. So obviously with FME, we have our little zipster. He's kind of the unsung hero that sits there in the background. He appeared in 2013 for sort of looking at zipping files up, hence his name. I can't believe that's nearly nine years ago. That still only feels like a couple of years ago. Um, so we have our little Zipster hero. He's been traveling the world, but he's come back. He's found a little business somewhere in Ireland that he wants to settle down with all the little transformers and actually just help him do some work, have a nice quiet time, you know, find where all these arms have fallen off to over the various years he's gone through. But obviously all heroes need a bit of a villain. And I'm borrowing this one from Dale because I thought this was a fantastic quote from the UC, that all data is evil and that left alone it will do bad things. If anybody's ever gone away on holiday and then come back two weeks later to find what's gone on, yeah, data will just do mean things to you while you're away. Sounds like sales. Yeah, I was left say, normally what happens is we come back and Garrett's won some really good ideas and yeah. And say, challenges. So not that Garrett's a challenge, but we have a lot of different things that we can. Only four minutes in and you're making fun of me already. That's a new record. Well done. Hey, normally it's earlier <laughs> than that. It's like four yeah, minutes. True. I think you are lightly. <laughs> but a lot of the time you'll find, you know, zip defines that you've got a lot of these problems. You know, you'll have things like the Oracle path not being set up correctly, you've got errors. You know, we've got the log file that's, you know, a work of art if you can read it, but obviously it's a little bit intimidating if not. You know, we've got lots of readers that maybe have got quite old over the years. If you're coming in to put new post, you're finding old workspaces that have been floating around. So there's generally lots and lots of challenges with data. And one of the really nice things, I think, with 2022 is that there's lots of little bits in here that are making life much, much easier to work with, much easier to work with your data. So... I'm going to hand over to Kieran and just get him to run through a couple of the new things that are making it a little bit easier to work with. Thanks, Gavin, and good morning, everybody, and, and thanks again, Don, for your, your session this morning. So, yeah, the first thing is the, the, the log files. Log files have always, you know, been a challenge. You're always looking for the red line to find the error, and, and over the last few years, we had the filtering which came into it, which was really useful, and now um, you can actually click on the transformer, and the transformers are explicit in the log file. So, again, 
helping with that developer operations, speeding up the time to actually get to the issue and you know trying to trying to figure out through the log file. So actually being able to click on the transformer and see where that is in the log and see and be able to understand the but the, the bug. Again, that's just really useful, really useful when you're trying to, especially that workbench on screen is nice and small, but on bigger ones, you know, getting through these errors is, is, is really uh, is really complex. So that's a, a great new piece in FME22. You haven't yet. And um, again, being able to look at, I think this is, again, Don talked about the GitHub integration this morning. You know, as we're looking at developer operations, you know, you're going to have versions of workbenches and everybody has them. And also you might have in teams, I know a lot of our FME, a lot of our FME customers historically had one or two people, but that's changing with the enterprise licenses. Now we're seeing multiple, more, many people working on FME workbenches, many people working together. So having the ability then to see the old workbench and the new workbench to see the change, to understand who broke it is usually the uh, question. And what was the break? Again, really, really important. Again, it, it's something that you would have normally always seen in standard coding, but to see it in the workbench now, to see it there, again, really, really powerful. And I'm terrible for downloading workspaces and then downloading them into multiple different places and forgetting which one is the one I'm updating. Or yeah, you look yeah. at the server and then we find that we've got some that are in GitHub, some that are in SharePoint, some that are on local file system. And it's like, which was the, actually the last one and what are the differences? So I think this is just huge as it is. The stuff that Dom was showing before with that yeah. Git integration is going to make it even easier and even better going forward. And I know that one's been something people have been chasing for for a long time. And uh, get upsert again, a big thing. Uh, we do some work in, in our uh, BI side where you, we've got like gaming companies who are doing, you know, millions of transactions every day. They don't want to refresh the full data warehouse. So they want to be able to change parts of the data so that then they can redo their analytics. So in the BI that they're only updating what's changed, not having to clean out the data warehouse. So now to have upsert in all these formats, again, when you are, when you are working with masses of millions of data, you can't truncate and drop and rebring in. You have to be able to change what's changed and do it quickly and efficiently. We have one customer who refreshes their data warehouse every five minutes. And this is not hundreds of records. This is hundreds of thousands of records and they have to do upserts. They can only change what's changed. So the fact now that we can keep all these current data and these cloud data warehouses like Redshift um, and like PostgreSQL, but also then in the old databases as well, really, really useful, really more efficient way of keeping data live. So again, uh, yeah, I think that's just uh, really good. And hopefully you might see it in some of the other uh, snowflakes as well in the future, Don. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, so say this one's just the change detector. I think it's something you guys will be familiar with. It's just taking basically planning data, land parcels, and updating ArcGIS Online from an interior business layer. So traditionally, people have used the change detector. You know, you have your traditional inserts, updates. With the new change detector in 2022, we've obviously got this upsert option. So it just combines them. So it's not just the writers and they've got the upsert ability, the change detector supports it as well. And we can change that mode between its traditional insert and update straight back to the up, upsert version as well. That sets the FME DB operation parameter, which is basically just saying if it's an update or up, up insert or a delete and obviously then the writer will handle that one as well and that's now explicitly called out in the AGOL layer as well so it makes it a little bit more obvious when you're building it that that's what's actually happening in the past that you got supported but it just wasn't clear um, that's what that was there. Very cool yeah. Uh, schema scanner again as we're looking at the changes with data warehouses being able to scan and, and look at the uh, schema drifts or whatever kind of changes and being able to identify that again really useful as we're looking at as systems more are changing faster and faster so you know we, we actually they have these kind of tools that can actually call out what's going on and what changes are coming is again really really powerful so yeah uh can give the best fit to scan the schema and then make sure your data quality is good and reduce your storage costs so yeah really really useful at detecting those uh those kind of for defining more robust data flows and i do think i can see the method the, 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 str the strategy from say if uh, you know it is all about improving developer operation times 
so that you're not spending as much time working on building the flow lines and that you can then get quicker time to insight, which is really, we think is, 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 is very much where everybody needs to be going. And I say, this is just an example of how we can use it. So the first one's very, very basic. We have a standard CSV, which has got our four attributes. We run it through the schema scanner. Um, that generates the schema feature. So you'll see that in that feature information window there. So it's a list element. So we can see we've got our attributes, we've got the different data types um, that FME is generated. If you want to make that a little easier, you can run it through the list explorer and it just flattens it down. So you can see there now as sort of traditional attributes, we've got the different um, attribute names in there. We've got the types that have been identified by FME. And obviously then we've got their position there as well, just within that stack. And does that gap, and then because we get the type, then we can also build in the kind of data quality pieces, because then if we're saying, well, this is a date field, and exactly that we can build all of that those processes through so in this example here we're doing it for a web service so it's just a json web service we have attributes but we don't know what those attributes are so obviously if we have a model we can obviously test using the schema scanner that it fits to that business model or we can use it to actually derive that model dynamically so that we can run that through so here we've read the valuations office api we've pulled in a whole bunch of data but now the schema scanners actually define what that wants to be. So we've got our attributes there, we've got the attribute types, and um, we can set it to ignore some of the internal attributes we don't need. We can be very explicit about the width and position. We can also do date detection. So you can pick up if it's a date or just a number. And then we can use FME's dynamic writing capabilities to actually then write that data out with that schema. So if the API schema updates, then the schema that we write out is going to update as well because we're doing it all dynamically. So we're not hard coding anything in here. And it's always been one of FME's really core strengths. It's just never been maybe as obvious. Now it's really, really explicit. And then touching on Kieran's point, this is where we can use that schema scanner to actually check and do some other validation. So here we're only checking on the names. So you can see here we've got an original data set. We've got the update to it, but the data is slightly different. In terms of its schema, we're just getting the two schema features, exploiting them down so you can have the attributes, running them through the feature joiner, and then pushing them through. And then where they don't join, obviously we've got three that basically aren't fitting the model. So we can then run that out to a terminator, we can run that out to a report. But exactly as Kieran's saying, we could also then start to say, well, is the date type right? You know, if we've got a number coming in, is it actually a date? Is it coming through correctly? Is it a string when actually it should be numeric as well. So at this point for this example, we've only really looked at the high level schema for the attribution, but we can obviously build in that next level of checking as well. So it just really gives us a lot more validation and things that we can do as part of our processing um, as we run through. I say not everything that's new is big um, and I think Certainly, whenever we look at like FME 2023 that's coming out, everybody is excited about the really big things, but there's lots of really little improvements that go into FME that you know don't make the top 10 features that are coming through, but actually make a real difference to how you use FME. And they're the ones that you really notice when you jump back a couple of versions because suddenly they're not there and you're so used to something that maybe is quite small, but actually makes a really, really big difference. Um, so one, I was just going to pull out was I really like this new ability in 2022 to actually pretty print your JSON. Previously, I'll be taking JSON out. I'll put it into JSON lint, run it through the JSON formatter transformer. Now, literally, I can just go in the bottom left of the dialog box. You can actually format your text up how you want for different languages. So if it's JSON, we can format it for JSON, for HTML. But what it will also do now is actually just pretty prints it for you. So it's a quite a small change but it's just so useful. It saves so much time. Um, so if you've not ever looked at that one, that's one, and you're using a lot of JSON, that's one that's worth going to have a look at. So you can toggle line numbers on there as well. We've been using the character encoding one recently with a couple of customers to actually try and catch some errors that they were seeing. So there's an awful lot of power in some of those you know, very, very simple bits of functionality there um, as you run through. Um, and then same with the HTTP cooler. Um, there's a few new bits to it that make this very, very powerful. The simultaneous requests ones mean we can make concurrent requests to the same API. So we can basically speed up processing. Um, that one's been in for a little while, but you might not have come across it. So if you're making web service calls, for example, to bring a background map in, 
you've got a number of customers calling out to like a WMS service, WMTS, you know, that can really speed up your process. But again, a lot of APIs don't support really, really high throughput, and FME can throw an awful lot of messaging at stuff very, very quickly. And again, that can break some APIs, you know, you basically end up getting blacklisted. So what we can do is we can now use rate limiting to slow down that process. And previously, we you know, used things like the deaccelerator transformer to slow FME down deliberately. Now we can do that straight within the transformer. So it's much, much cleaner, a little bit more specific about that process. And then lastly there, we've also now got this retry on failure. So as we try more and more of these web services, they don't always work first time. Um, AGLE used to be the classic. I know a lot of our customers have had issues with AGLE in the past where it just wasn't ready for the request. It would refuse and therefore the whole workflow would crash or stop. These days, not it will retry and it's a lot more smoother, especially on server. But that same functionality is now within desktop. So we can do that same thing within the desktop tool as well now as part of those things. So if you are looking at querying APIs, there's a whole host of different HTTP errors that you can try on. So it might be if something's just a not ready, if the service is down though, maybe you terminate it and don't check for those ones. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And then this is one of my other little favorite ones that snuck in. Um, it's the ability to put HTML into the push pins on the HTML reports. We know a lot of customers are using the HTML reporting. Um, and traditionally, you've only been able to put like an attribute as an identifier in there, um, at least easily. So now what you can do is put an entire HTML content in there. And I've literally just taken the output of the HTML report generator and then fed that into another HTML report generator to actually give me that internal content. So again, it's very, very easy to build up. And all you need to do is in the HTML report generator, you'll see there's a new escape HTML option. You can just flick that to no, and obviously then we can support that kind of HTML content in those bubbles. And it just really adds those richness of those reports. It means you can make things a little bit more intuitive as you're running around and selecting them. So it works really, really well. I think the HTML reports has just been so successful for us. It's like every customer is just building them. And now when we add that piece in, that's really going to uh, kick in because then it just makes the, the mapping bit that more, bit more dynamic and what people will be used to with their GIS. Like, so yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. And I think the HTML in general is just so flexible as an output format. It just works so well with the FME streaming services and things to really build, you know, entire applications to build mobile apps. You know, you can build really rich reports. It's just such a powerful and flexible ability um, there out of the box. Um, I'm going to say Safe always used to say that every FME release was going to be faster than the last one. It's generally been true, bar possibly the odd one or two. Um, but this one is fast. Um, when you're running through some of the performance times we have seen, you know, it's very, very quick and it's very, very efficient. So, so not everything you always see that go from, comes from the developer teams are always the big flashy new things. It's a new transformer. It's a new format. There's an awful lot of work that goes on under the hood that never gets seen until you actually run a workspace. And this, I think, is really the fruition of a lot of work that's been done and a lot of really hard work that's been done over the last few years. And it's really paid off. Um, some of the performance we've seen has been immense, um, to be fair. And obviously, I don't believe the sales team, whenever they turn up, it's like everything works on PowerPoint. So I'm very, very skeptical whenever you see these things. So we thought, fine, we're going to try some of these, see if it really is as good as everybody keeps saying it's supposed to be. So we took 100 millilitres of a buffer from the center of Ireland and said, right, I want 100 meter tiles from that. So basically, we're going to tile that data set. So it's very, very simple workflow. 28.6 seconds in FME 22. That's about three and a half million features, roughly, depending on quite how you shape your buffer zone. Um, tried the same workflow in FME 2021. Took three hours and literally blew the computer up. Um, it stole all of my disk space. It moved everything to the cloud to try and steal all the local disk space back. Yeah, and just died. Um, exactly the same because you were running a Mac though. Um, I think the Windows one would have died before. <laughs> oh, you don't touch on his Mac. You know he's an Apple man. He has a tattoo. He's got an Apple logo on his back. You like don't. It's because I want stuff to work. I've got fed up with trying to just debug Windows. <laughs> but it's a massive performance gain. And it's something that, you know, doesn't seem like a huge thing, but obviously means that we can now run workflows that we've never been able to run in the past, or we've been able to run workflows very, very quickly 
that previously would have literally been left overnight. I mean, that was taking two and a half hours, three hours to tr even try and run and didn't complete. You know, the same workflow is now 30 seconds. Um, similarly, point on area overlayer. Um, I know this one's huge. I had to go and find a UK data set for this one, sorry. I couldn't find enough crime in Ireland to actually match with the UK. We were fine, we could get big numbers. So we took six million features through, took the force boundaries, point and area overlay, ran that through the same workspace, 2021.1, 22.1, yeah, four and a half minutes down to 24 seconds. Um, and the other point is that memory footprint is dropped significantly. Um, it's about 6 million kilobytes down to 200,000 kilobytes of memory used. Um, that's massive in terms of performance, but in terms of things that people use, that point and area overlay transformer is hugely popular. If you're doing addresses into area boundaries, you know, quite often customers will have a lot of these in their workflows in one workspace, you know, saving four minutes per point on area overlay transformer, you know, that's a big saving overall. So I think that's really going to make a big difference to people's performance, not only in reducing your time, but letting you push more data through. Mm -hmm. you know, same with that tiling issue, you can now run a lot more data through these workflows. Um, that does bring up the challenge of obsolete workspaces. How do we deal with the stuff getting older? You know, workspaces get old. Um, that classic one with the tiler, I spent a lot of last night trying to work out why it wasn't working properly. I was rerunning the workspace. It was taking two hours to run through. It gets to nine o'clock and it's like, well, I just need the map of the tile zone. I need to put this in. It's like, how did I get this to work last time? Suddenly realized I hadn't upgraded the transformer. So the transformer I still had was the old version. Upgraded it, click go, 24 seconds later, the data's out. And it's like, well, that was annoying. I really wish I'd remembered I hadn't actually put the old um, version in. And again, it means we can start to do some of these updates to our workspaces. They need that little bit of maintenance sometimes when they are getting older and certainly take advantage of some of these performance things as well. You know, just keeping them up to date helps. So the Zipsters found this um, workflow. He wants to take the little family of transformers off to Disneyland. There's a great website you can see queue times. So previous colleague of his built this, but he's got an old workspace that he then wants to actually bring up to take make use of some of these new functions and functionality. It makes a little call to a script. It does some data scraping. There's a really useful HTML extractor transformer if you've never seen it. You can put in the CSS operators you want and it will pull some data down for you. But you can see, you know, we've got things like little visualizers or inspectors um, still floating around on the canvas there. You know, the attribute manager's flagged up saying, hang on, something's wrong where previously it wasn't doing that. Um, there's some new better logic for detecting things now in 2022 and some of the later 2020 releases. We've got our upgrade transformers and you can see we've got a slightly older version of the writer there as well. So we want to bring this one up. We want to make use of all the new functionality and things as part of our process. So if we just run the workspace, we'll get a little warning because we've got our attribute manager there. Um, in this case, we're going to ignore it because it doesn't really matter. But you can see we've got all the feature caching. Um, this is, I could not go back to FME prior to feature caching. Um, it's such a fundamental step change. Um, but it means we don't need the visualizers, so I can instantly declutter those, remove these. I can also come in and use this really handy option at the bottom here, just to clean up and refresh the attribute manager. Um, if you've never seen it, it's just hidden away down the bottom right hand corner of the attribute manager, lets you come in and refresh them, remove all those rows that you know, maybe are obsolete for whatever reason. I can also come in, I can update that writer. So that's going to bring that up to the latest definition. In HTML ones, relatively simple, probably doesn't make a huge difference, but some of the database ones for really old workspaces, you know, it'll mean that you can now leverage all the web connection capabilities, which are much, much easier to use um, and manage long term. And again, Don mentioned that bulk mode support. So we've got that option down the bottom there. So if you see a transformer that has that included in it as one of its options to upgrade, you know, that's going to give you some of those performance enhancements. So you can see that's a little bit of an old one. So we can just come in, look at the changes. I come onto the transformer, just right mouse click and upgrade it. It's going to give me some warnings and a nice side by side to go through and update those as well. We can also expand out. And if we've got multiple versions of these, we can click through, see where they are in the workspace, a bit like with the um, transfer or the log dialog there as well. Again, we can see our side by side, we can upgrade those ones through. 
And you can also see which versions you've got. So that's a H version one of a HTTP caller. But if you just expand that a little bit, we can see that's actually version five is the latest. So we're you know, four or five versions behind. So we're going to upgrade that one as well. If there's some warnings, you know, it's worth having a read through to see if we're impacted. You can check that side by side to make sure everything's as you expect. And again, we can check the log to make sure what's come through. So all the synchronous writing, for example, is new in there, and we could just upgrade those through. So it's quite quick and easy to go through and upgrade your workspaces. And um, there's a couple of different points you can do that. And obviously from there, you can see that that's actually going to give you, you know, a nice, clean, more modern workspace that hopefully is going to run a little bit quicker as well for you and a lot more efficiently as we run through. And ultimately, you know, means the zipster can happily run off. He can find all the quickest roller coasters and stuff that he can go on to and things as he runs around. Um, so on the server management, you know, there's a lot we can do. And I think more and more what we're finding is that servers gone from one person managing FME server to lots of people using it. And that means that's a lot more people coming in. There's a lot more jobs running on it. And it's a lot harder to understand you know, just what's going on. Um, Don's given a fantastic overview of the server analytics that are coming in 2020. Two, Dot two later on this year and next into next year with 2023. Um, some of that's already there. So there's already a foundation for that. And I think as Garrett's saying, it's going to be huge for users. You're really going to be able to see, you know, where the peaks are, what is your throughput, what engines are being used, what engines are underutilized. And it's always the conversation we have with customers around, you know, how do we utilize the engines? Where should we put those jobs? You know, which engines should we assign? Do we need to run really rapid engines, what happens to our ETL, does a certain department need an engine and things. So this is going to make that much, much more transparent. It's going to make it a really data-led um, process as we go through. Now, we can see where there's capacity. You know, where can we put in scheduled jobs, you know, a new automation? Where is it really, really busy? And again, there are the traditional dashboards, and I think they're going to very much disappear by the sounds of it and the looks of it, which is great. There's going to be a lot more there. Um, the other one we'd like to do, and I guess Zipster likes to do, is we have our own SciSense dashboarding technology. There's APIs there. We can link that into those dashboarding platforms so we can actually push some of those metrics more corporately. So we don't just have to have the dashboarding in FME for users to see. We can put up some of those queue times so they can go on to the intranet. They can go up to management just to see how much work FME is doing. So you can start to link that out as part of those processes. And we'll show you that integration between SciSense and, and FME later on this morning in my session after the break. And I say it really is gives a really good example of how we can actually link out to some of these things and just, you know, have a different view on the metrics and the work that FME does, because quite often it will just run in the background, process tens of thousands of jobs, and nobody really knows about it because it just works. Um, it's one of FME's worst things is that most of the time it just works absolutely fine. So people tend to forget it's there because it's so good at what it does. Um, we've also got nice job metrics. So if you are tracking down issues, you want to look at your resource load. Um, we've got really good job metrics now. We've also got the new run by option or ran by option. So if you're looking at running a server app, for example, you can now see who ran that server app. Previously, it was always going to come back as admin because the engine ran it, so you couldn't see who ran it. And if you've got lots of people in the organization running the app, it was hard to work out, you know, how did Garrett's one fail compared to Kieran's one, for example. You know, you can track them down a little bit better now. We've also got counts of errors. And, and does that then also work, Gavin? So if people, are, again, go back to some of our later presentations, if somebody's entering data or capturing data during the server app, then we've also got a kind of automatic audit built there through that yeah. as well it gives you exactly that we can actually get the users who've entered it um, and again i know that's been a, something a customers have um, struggled with a little bit in the past because they wanted to know who was logging in so as long as you're logging into the app then you'll be able to see it and that goes into the saml and azure stuff we'll touch on shortly as well about being able to do single sign-on type approaches um, just on time, guys, just to kind of make you aware of it. So I know uh, it's all really, really great stuff, but uh, poor Philip is is dying to, to to jump on and present next. He's very excited. That's right. Sorry, we've only got a quick one. Just then with um, Azure Active Directory, just touching on that. So it's been something a lot of customers have asked for. 
Um, Philip himself actually um, was a real pioneer for this for us. Um, this is in 2022. It's a little bit more polished. Um, the first version, I think, I know there's a couple of issues with in terms of the way that it worked for them. Um, it's great now. Um, we can come in, we can look for individual users. So we can add Garrett, for example, um, as part of that process. We can go through, we can then add him to roles. We can also bring groups through. Um, the one thing, and there's a really good article on the community if you do want to do this, um, you do need to get your Azure kind of manager involved to set up a little server or an application on the Azure side and then to give you the client secret to link in. So there is, like you would do with a traditional on-premise AD, there's a little bit of business um, logic to sort out there as well, but it's very, very straightforward. And um, once you've got it, obviously it means we can bring things through. And then we have this sign in with Microsoft option. So you can follow that standard route. And again, you're not managing the passwords. We've got those out to the end user. So the end, or Microsoft basically takes care of it. And you have one user for all of your services, one password. So when that changes, um, you can bring that through. So that's a very basic app. So Garrett, close your eyes. You don't have to look at that one. And then we've also got the option in FME desktop as well. So we can use the connections. You'll see we've got our connections there. We can use our Azure AD. And then we've got our Azure, Azure, the Azure AD connection set up. So we can use the Active Directory through desktop there as well. So it just makes everything a lot more flexible, a lot easier to manage. It's one less password. And if you are pushing this out to lots of users, especially with server apps, you know, it becomes really, really useful. Um, and then lastly, quickly, just a couple of things just to touch on is more and more of you are moving over to bigger enterprise deployments these days, um, especially with the subscription model that Garrett's going to talk about. Failover is something that's coming back up, I think, is something that more and more customers are interested in. How do you keep this up? You know, you've got all these users. That gone are the days when if you switched FME off, nobody would really notice because it was just a GIS guy in the corner. You know, there's a lot more interactivity. So if you are starting to think about that route, there are lots of options. So just reach out to us and get in touch. Um, the mobile apps, I say, have been evolving. So if you've not looked at them recently, the AR one especially has got some really cool stuff with a GPS location in, great for flow lines, um, as Don mentioned. Data Express has got a nice clean new look there as well. So if you've not looked at them, do go out and obviously have a play with them. And hopefully that gives us a really happy Zipster family. At the end of the day, he's all happy. Everything's running now internally in the office. He can just put his little wheels up, have a cup of coffee, and spend some time with the little Transformer family. Brilliant. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. You flew through that. Brilliant. Um, I will hold questions. So if there is questions, please ask them. And what we'll probably do just to kind of catch up on a bit of time is we'll try to address them at the end or failing that what we'll do is we'll just come back to you directly or we'll post them up on our, the Irish FME community as well. So again, it's a place that you can come to and, and grab them. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Philip from the Valuations Office, who is going to be presenting on data-driven reporting automated with FME. So I know this has been a... a a real brainchild of yours for a couple of years now, I guess, from when we first kind of picked up FME and then kind of moved on to, I suppose, this huge enterprise workflow to create this pretty complex document, which I think is fascinating. And um, so, sorry, I'm not going to steal any of your turn there, Philip. Sorry. Do you want to uh, kick off and share your screen? I hope you can see my screen and hear me. Uh, I can hear you. I just can't see your screen. So over on the left-hand column, you'll see share. It's underneath stop. Yeah, I did, I, did, I did share that, I believe. Uh, no, because you needed Gavin to stop. So now you should be able to go in and share it. Apologies. No, you're absolutely fine. Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, yes, it is. It just took a second to come up. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, so thanks, Gareth, for the intro. Um, and um, thanks for the agenda to put me right after Dawn and then Gavin. So it's no pressure at the first place to start with anyway. Um, as Gareth mentioned, um, yeah, this has been uh, my brainchild for last year, maybe as long as I'm using FME. I'm a new, naive user to FME. I'm only using FME for probably last three, 
three and a half, two and a half years, three years. From that, you could understand that there is probably 10 or 15 transformers that I know how to use very well and 10 or 15 that I know what it does and probably another million of them that I don't know how it works and all that. So um, to my presentation would be quite simple compared to what Don and uh, Gavin had said, but um, it has a key point that I think makes it unique. It's about the data-driven uh, document. Um, so when we all talk about FME, we all go to that uh, brain situation where we talk about GIS and maps and geospatial aspect of it. But uh, this project totally caters a different aspect of it called data. So most of this uh, is, is based on pure data, text, calculations, images, and all that. And maps are involved, and it's a good bit as well. So um, the whole project actually started when we did an automation audit in, back in our office. Sorry, I forgot to mention I'm from the valuations office. And so in our office, we did an automation audit back in 2019. And um, the audit revealed that this particular document that we use in our office is consuming a lot of human hours. And if we could automate that document to a good extent, it will save us a lot of labor. So considering that in mind, as you can see, to put it in numbers, um, an, an official used to take three to five working days to generate one of these documents if all the data is readily available. And considering the number of documents needed over a year, it, it added up to 42,000 human hours over a year, which could be very quantitatively reduced if it can be automated. As you can see on the slide, they recommend they mentioned that it could come down to less than 1% from 17% um, on human hours. So that was the end goal that we were trying to achieve. Talking about the document, the document had all kinds of data in it. Believe me, all kinds of data in it. So um, the, the reason for us considering FME to start this project in the first place was the idea was to use FME's capability to, to get maps uh, yeah, for the GIS aspect of it and use other tools to bring it together. Because um, to put it into perspective, the document cannot be automated fully. The document had to be uh, human intervened to complete. And in that scenario, you cannot create a PDF document or an HTML page. You have to have it in either Word or CSV, Word ideally, um, so that people can go and edit it at the end to complete it. So um, considering that aspect, so we were thinking we will get the GIS from FME and the rest all from other tools and put it together in some other way. But when started working with FME, we found that FME could be used all the way through. And I'm glad to say that FME is doing the process in and out. There is nothing else being involved except we have dashboards coming from Tableau. Everything else is FME and fully FME. So um, as you can see, the document has calculations, pictures, um you name it uh, except mp3s and uh, video files everything else was in it. so to put that together into a word document was quite a challenge and i i really want to appreciate gavin and carrot's help putting it together because they those guys helped me a lot while i was doing the, the project myself and as you all know i don't think i have to mention this that is always messy it don't come in the way you want and if it comes in the way you want that's not the way you want to put it out there so um it was quite challenging the, the benefits we were trying to get out of it is, or the benefits that we achieved after doing this project was, from an operational perspective of the office, we had a base template to work with. So if, if you have a change in the whole document itself, you could just do that edit in one location in an FME workbench, and it'll be all around. Everybody will follow through. The economic benefit I have mentioned already, that you save a lot of human hours. It was 80% automated. So loads of savings there technically there was a lot of challenges uh, because if you have a technical document to be generated there are in previous times you have to make sure all the staff who are doing it are technically sound to either do it otherwise 10 people will do it in 10 different ways and you will have 10 different outputs and if it represents your organization then it won't look good also there will be people who are not technically capable to do certain things that if you have a platform to do it for, for them, then you have a base and then everything will look symmetrical and everything will look uh, ideal and it'll, it'll be good for the organizational perspective. 
legal compliance since the document that i'm talking about is uh, to be submitted to a court and it is a legal document at the end of the day and um, all the legal legal uh, stuff that we need to be put on the document has to be mandatorily done and that was a problem initially because people were missing things um for example um the maps has to be not facing that was a ruling um we couldn't tell everybody to put a compass on a map and many people don't know how to do it still but if you have FME to do in that then half of that job is done that was um, the legal compliance part. again the scope itself is uh, the same thing that I mentioned in the last slide that these were the benefits that we were trying to achieve but using FME we managed to achieve a lot more than that we we managed to resource all our maps from a single source so all map looked from one way rather than one map from Google and one map from um, um, OSI and one map from Bing would have been a different uh, scenario. Um, data from many other websites has been added on. That's additional data. I'm going through it in the later slides. Prime 2 database came in. Um, it, Google Maps, images. We enhanced the documents from what we thought we could do. We enhanced the document to about another 50% and the customers are like the people who are doing it are quite happy in what we provided them at the end of the day. So uh, this is, um, a, a, I don't think I need to speak about how FME can handle maps, but the reason why I'm putting this as additional features is because I wanted to walk through, uh, walk you through the, the hurdles we came across while we were doing this. Uh, as I said, the maps were extracted as an, as an uh, image and was put on to a Word document. So as you can see uh, in the picture that I'm uh, displaying here, there's a subject property which is, and a comparable property which is in a purple circle. And um, as, you, as you all know, you probably all know more GIS than me. And I will say, if the map is a bigger one, because these properties are too close by, the map looks nice. But if a property is a hundred kilometer away from the subject property, then the map, the base layer itself is going to be different. The, the subject property, even the, the small little things like the size of the compass, the size of the compass depends on the scale of the map that you're putting in. The size of the text varies and you cannot predict what the difference between or what the distance between the two properties is, what the baseline is coming in. So it was all has to be calculated on the fly. And that was the case where there is only one property compared to the other property. Now, imagine in a case where there is one property compared to 10 other properties and one property is 200 kilometers away and one property is five kilometers away. What baseline are you going to bring in? Those are all challenges. And all these capabilities, FME helped me a lot um, to work with. And then came the real struggle to put it into an image that fits in the same size, in the same format in a Word document. Some images came horizontally big, some images came out vertically um, and it wasn't a, a format at all. And again, I still don't understand the full math behind it. And thanks to Gavin on that, um, we managed to tackle it and um, we put it out there and I'll, I'll show you uh, um, the document uh, all together in a later stage. So it was uh, quite challenging, but um, FME, the resources FME provided was quite helpful in that scenario. Then came the, the county map. This was um, a bit of a struggle to get in because you just you just don't have to display, don't want to display a map with bare land in it. You wanted to bring in waterways, you wanted to bring in rail lines, you wanted to bring in roads, and there was legal compliance to have road names associated with it, which was challenging as well. Again, we got it from the Open Data API, and it worked well as well. So that's that's all things that you know that FME can do and FME do well. But there are things. Um, like um there are other things as well so sorry before going into that i just want to give a quick overview of a small section of the workbench this uh transformer so this bookmark is there is to demonstrate that that is just to extract one image of the whole document and they, when i say they, the, the smallest document i have seen is 60 pages and the largest i have seen is about 400 odd pages and this bookmark is relating to one single image in one of those A4 pages. 
and that uh, that technically complicated it became at the end of the day it wasn't I, I i obviously wasn't starting the project thinking that it would be like that and just to mention mapnik rasterizer is probably one of the best transformers that i can use at this stage because i've used it in 200 million thousand spaces in in that uh, workbench itself these are the few uh, transformers that i've used all through and um, the, the pane on the left hand side will um, obviously Gavin will be looking at and telling me that I have to upgrade 72 transformers, but I want to show is what I really want to show is there is 603 transformers in the whole workbench, which I don't know how it ended up because we only started with five or six, as I remember. Um, so additional things that we brought into that, uh, documents are images. We had images, um, like TIFF, JPEGs, you name it. And if images was of different size, different clarity taken in different sources, FME was quite helpful in that sense as well to bring them all in and put it into the same page. Again, resize the images to the to the spec we want was uh, something because there were pages where we wanted two images displayed um, in same time, so we had to resize it. We had to we had to bring in uh, PDF documents like certs, certificates, um, you know, plans. All that has been brought in again. FME did a good job in there as well. Google Images was the second advancement or enhancement we onto it. So we managed to go to Google API and uh, pull out five images, uh, give it an X and a Y. Um, it was quite challenging to start with, uh, but um, it, it became quite helpful at the end of the day because images we had, as in the organization had for um, a property would have changed over time, but Google Images were a bit more um up to date and so we could get the uh, right picture rather than having boots on the ground and getting the picture done for a particular property it was quite helpful in that sense another extra extra feature that we brought in was the services api where uh, we managed to if a particular property is in in, in a county uh, meet uh, or in county wicklow uh, we wanted to know the average distance to a nearest guard station these are all additional informations to help the, the person to deal in court, say that, okay, my property is here and it has an average distance of five kilometers to a guard station or so and so, which is all additional benefits the user gained and which was all already given to them without even doing any homework of their own. That was um, the, the added benefit of it. Again, with calculations, especially since I was I wasn't any great with maths, FME was a help helping hand. Statistic calculator was the one transformer that I used quite extensively um, to bring in calculation, the floor areas, the the valuations of the areas, you know, and stuff like that, and bringing in totals and maximum values of it, and everything was uh, smooth. Regarding dashboards, uh, even though I mentioned Tableau in uh, in place, but we it's a bit of a cheat that I would say if I use Tableau, we integrated Tableau in a, in a way that we created the dashboard and integrated into the document as an image. As an image, but uh, in future we are trying to the, or the next phase of the development is we are trying to integrate into the Tableau so that um, we can uh, pull it live from the uh, dashboard. That's that's what we are thinking on upgrading in the next phase of the development. So just to give you an idea, the, the map on the left hand side is something that a human generated themselves or a human snipped out of um, being mapped themselves. And the same property has been mapped in um, by um, an automation and you can see the difference. And I don't think I have to explain it any further. Picture says a thousand ways as it say, you know, um, this is the overall picture of one of the smallest document that um, the machine generated and um, uh, there are a few things that we came across that some of the X and Y coordinates wasn't bringing us the Google images that we were looking for, but most of it, most of the times it was quite uh, efficient. And this is what the workbench looked like. And I think that's the end of my slide. Um, just to mention a couple of things that um, uh, touch base with what Gareth mentioned. Um, we when when we started FME, we only started with a few licenses, and we worked together uh, as two or three people within the organization. But um, regarding the web apps and stuff, we managed to integrate. We obviously we migrated the enterprise edition, where we got to have a few uh, licenses that we can float around, and we have few people 
doing things. And I'm really excited to test the thing that Gavin just mentioned about who run the web uh, app uh, to do that um, and why uh, number Mr. X got a failure and why Mr. Y succeeded and all that is going to be tested out here because we are successfully running it. And also we managed to integrate the Active Directory, which was a real helping hand because now we can track and track on the logs and see who's done and what, is, what has been happening. And I think uh, with that, I'll conclude today so that everybody can get a cup of tea. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, great presentation, uh, Philip. And uh, yeah, no, it's great to see how far the evaluation has come, uh, evaluations office has come in such a short amount of time. So starting off, as you said, with like one or two licenses, a small user base, um, and now obviously moving to the enterprise and I think about seven or eight users across the organization and then hopefully it growing with some of the changes coming down the line. So again, it's, it's great that A, that you're growing with FME, but also that you have that ability touching on later to be able to scale for the enterprise as well which i think is, is really really important i just have one quick question and people go make a cup of tea because we will kind of just jump straight into the next session because it's timed um but you'd mentioned at the very start forty two thousand hours and i just did quick calculations here it's like five thousand two hundred and fifty days of human uh, intervention or manual human intervention to create those reports and you mentioned roughly about 80 percent of that report now has been automated so it's just doing the calculations on that as well so from taking it from 5,200 hours down to less or sorry days down to roughly about a thousand days or from 42,000 hours down to about 8,400 hours like it's it's incredible and probably there's some more automation to be done there to kind of really push that number down but yeah that, like, that actually came in handy uh, Garrett uh, as we got a new, before um, we did the automation, there was no timeline in handing over this document. And now recently we have a new ruling from the courts saying that we will get a date for um, date of submission. And within 15 days, we have to submit this document. So we were under pressure to do it. And the automation really helped in that sense that we could do it in a matter of 30, 30 minutes. If somebody could just finish off a document if it's a small case, you know. Not for all cases, but yeah, it came in quite handy. It's quite helpful. And that was going to be my next question. So roughly about 20 hours to create one document. Roughly how long does it take to generate a report? So I know you're saying they range yeah. from 60 to 400 pages, but roughly Yeah, no, uh, on a memory. normal case, uh, the machine gen machine takes maybe three minutes to generate the 80% work. And then um, probably the human intervention of maybe half an hour to an hour, if they have everything handy, because... The most most of the things are in there already you know the, the yeah. groundwork is already done and as i i don't know whether you have noticed on the the whole image of the document there are a lot of places where it's red spots red uh, text those red texts are, are ident identification marks for the the person the official that there is something needs to be added or changed that's how the formatting has been done so it's quite clear and visible that they can change it whenever they want you know whatever they want to it's a it's an incredible uh, time, like incredible, incredible. Like think how much that costs, like 4,000 days of, a, of an individual or individual sitting there. Like it's just the ROI is just, yeah, back a hundredfold. It's it, it's incredible. Well done, Philip. Yeah. Thanks to my boss, uh, Fran Power, who came up with the idea. And thanks to FME and Gavin Park. Yeah, lovely. Brilliant. And again, you're being very, very modest. Again, recently just certified there to not even a week ago, recently as an FME professional. So yeah, yeah, well done. Congratulations yeah, thanks, on the certification. Yeah. So great work. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And you did That's well fantastic. in the Don. So I think you've impressed Don. Yeah, I love, I love this stuff. That's why I'm sticking around, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. super impressive. I'm just blown away by what, you know, people like you who are the true experts using FME do with it. It's It's really, really... You know, we have, so. we have a, we have a good team of uh, experts in here in FME now at this stage. We have three or four certified uh, professionals. A couple of guys are working heavy on GIS stuff. Well, I'm, I'm hands off GIS. I have no idea about GIS stuff myself, but <laughs> managed to pull something together thanks to everyone. But they're the use cases we're starting to look at and see more when we're talking about the enterprise that again gis is always going to be that strong pillar and will be relevant for most people here today but again that you can go out into the enterprise and look at i say we say non-spatial data but they call it data strangely enough <laughs> but again that we can we can just go in and we can play it doesn't matter if it's on the it side or digital services whatever it may be it doesn't always have to be from a gis standpoint which which is amazing so i guess guys i know we had said that we break for um a quick um uh, tea just, break. So again, we'll kick off. Just the, one the thing there, Gareth. We've one question that's come in about FME certified professional. Um, 
uh, about the FME certified professional, what skills are needed besides learning FME using the training sessions you have online? Like which coding languages do we need to know how server integration works, etc. Um, so from a desktop professional standpoint, um, you don't need to know. That's the whole point of that low code environment that FME offers. Again, it's just having a few years experience underneath your belt and um, using the tool. Uh, there's an online exam. I think it's an open book one. I think it takes about four odd hours and it, it's slightly changing now. So, um, but again, we'll have um, uh, an example. You'll have an exam, but then also you'll have some example workspaces that you'll submit almost like a, a mini thesis. I had created this workspace, I created this workspace um, and FME expert in safe software will have a review over that um, and then they will rank you based on that and you'll you'll get your, your certification. That's kind of how it works now. So um, yeah, come along. And this is the same setup for, for, for FME server as well. Again, we've, we've helped, I think we've had seven customers this year or eight customers get certified, um, which has been absolutely incredible. And again, um, especially the team evaluations, I think as, as Philip just said, there are four in the last little while. I know, I know some of the other, other teams have done it as well. So again, amazing work. Always don't be afraid to reach out to myself or Gavin or any of the team we can support you we can talk about things that you need in order to be prepared for it and then yeah ultimately go off and sit the exam and then um, hopefully we'll have you present then uh, next year so um, don't ever be afraid to reach out to us yeah I would say the community as well if you've not visited oh, as another yeah. fantastic resource if you are looking to build up that knowledge of FME that's another great place so it's not just obviously the user guys obviously the webinars the blog but that's a really good one for all the how-tos so that you know if you're just looking you can run through and just you know build out that knowledge um, that you've got which is obviously what comes through with the exam questions so as I say it's open book so you've got obviously all the help guides and that's another fantastic resource and again with FME you know a lot of it I find the certification really helpful because it makes you stop and think about some of the things and challenges some of your assumptions so you can go back and check and say does it transformer really do that or have I just made that up and you know, which ones are there? So it's a great program um, and it really does, I think, help you personally develop as well as you go through. Um, and even just from a career standpoint, if you look at any of the jobs from a, a GIS perspective that have been up over the last little while, I think I think everyone that I've seen in probably the last eight months has FME as a requirement in there, which is a testament to how why the adoption is of FME across Ireland. So again, it is something that can help you in your career uh, as you move on to say that you have these types of certifications. And yeah, no, that's, I think that's it's pretty good. So yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to us. Um, so we're gonna jump over to the other session now. Um, so again, Don, I don't know, I know it's it's quite late and thank you for staying. So I don't expect you to just come all the way through, but um, again, if, if you want to duck out and finally get some sleep, but oh, I'm sure <laughs> I did see you drinking coffee there at one stage. So you can try <laughs> to sleep, unfortunately. Yeah, um, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, no, it's been brilliant having yeah, you along. Yeah. Sorry, Karen. No, great, great. And, and thanks so much for having me. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Maybe it'll be in person, which would be yes, a lot of fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I think, Garrett, just to let them for the, for the users and Tanya, I think we the session is set to start at 11 35, the second one. Are, are yeah, I'll have. Yeah, oh. I'll have to hop on and just pull that back a bit. Um, okay, so we go for 11.30 or I'll give people a few minutes break or, or sooner, Garrett, what do you think? Uh, no, well, we'll give, uh, sorry, I didn't know the session got moved. So what we'll do is we'll yeah. give people 10 minutes. So it's 11.20 now. So at 11.30, if you come okay. back onto the link, um, we'll, we'll we'll kick off. And it is Michael from Dublin Fire Brigade opening up around uh, using webhooks in FME in order to uh, support Tableau reporting. So again, really, really exciting one coming up next. And, and I'll just say one final thing before everyone goes. I have to say that was a fantastic presentation by Philip of what the guys have done. I do remember we did a map neck rasterizer presentation about five years ago or six years ago, maybe even more, where we did a project for the with OSI for the Irish for the guards to create a national map. To see that now being used inside the uh, world report to create those maps. And again, I've involved with a lot of map production over the years. Like that really is, it just shows the power of the product, but also the work that the guys have done. So I have to say now, that, that blew me away when I saw that with the, the Google images, the, the, the live feed of the map into the Word document. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why that would, that, I, did, I didn't I didn't realize we had done all that, the guys had done all that. So I have mm -hmm. to say that's, it was really impressive now, I have to say. Absolutely. Philip's only that's 21. Fantastic. I don't think it's taken a toll on him at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, go on. See you all soon. See you now. See you all right, in 10 minutes.